the strongest hero is betrayed by humanity and reincarnates as an overpowered Dark Lord. Leonis was one of the three heroes assigned to protect a city that was being attacked by ogres. Arakale starts casting a powerful magic, however, he wanted to eradicate not only the monsters but also the citizens. Then, Terrace would use her power to revive the citizens. Yet, Leonis had another idea. He didn't want to see the citizens suffer, so he used his sword to cut Arakale's spell in half. Arakale was confused, but Leonis, who was still 12 years old at the time, couldn't see people being eradicated and being brought back to life. He then jumped down and started to fish the ogres one by one. The citizens watched in awe as he sliced the ogres and even wrestled another one. Something was clear, every citizen saw Leonis as a true hero and loved him. However, the other two didn't like Leonis, especially Arakale. And that's why four years later Leonis was assigned to defeat a monster, being guided by a villager. The villager is pretty happy as they will be helped by Leonis, who is considered the greatest swordsman and the hero of the Holy Sword. The villager complimented Leonis' skills, who simply dismissed it, mentioning his job was to defeat the demon lord. The two arrived at the monster's location, but Leonis was confused because the spot was empty. He turned back to ask the villager where the monster was. However, the villager had disappeared. Leonis then realizes this is a trap and tries to reach out for his weapon. However, some gravity magic was cast on him to restrain him. He sees three mages around him, and then some soldiers also appear. The soldiers quickly grab some chains and restrain him in the air. The nobles of the kingdom didn't like Leonis' power or influence, so they decided to wipe him out. The soldiers quickly ran forward with their spears and stabbed Leonis in the chest. He tried to resist, but in the end, he lost all his strength. The soldiers put him down, commented on how their job was done, and walked away. Minutes later, a girl appears before him. She knows he can still hear her, and asks him how he feels after being betrayed by the people he saved. Leonis had negative thoughts, yet, he couldn't resent humanity for betraying him. She asks what he thinks about this world, but Leonis didn't care about it because he was about to die. The girl then reveals that she wishes to rebel against the world. Leonis is confused, but she explains that she's Roselia, the goddess of rebellion. She holds his hand, promising to revive him not as a hero, but as the new Dark Lord, who will save the world. Since then, Linus slowly started to turn into an undead. He spent years fighting wars as a demon lord, until one day, he returns to his castle and meets Roselia again, and he presents her with the spoils of war. She tells him to hold on to them for a while and commends him for being very powerful. He tells her he's made a new noble friend named Blackus, and his people will be taken into Lenny's kingdom to be protected. Roselia also presents him with his old holy sword as a gift for his victory. She tells him the holy sword doesn't suit him anymore and changes it to a demon sword. She tells him he can't draw the sword unless it calls his truth into question. But a few years later, the six heroes decided to war against Linus who assumed his full appearance as the Dark Lord. The Demon Lord's army of skeletons rushes into the battlefield to face the heroes. But the heroes have been blessed with godly powers and now have angel forms. The Demon Lord Leonis was sitting in his room chamber watching everything from his ball. All his strongholds have been defeated and this is their last line of defense. The skeletons manage to clap some human soldiers, but one of the heroes has the power to bring them back to life. Suddenly, a huge tree-like creature appears, making the demon lord angry because he recognizes it as the arch-sage hero who quit being human to get more power. Linus gets up and summons his staff to join the fight, but his Fenrir companion and loyal general stops him, reminding Linus that he made a promise to the goddess of rebellion. She had entrusted him to do something when he was still human, so Leonis decided to accept defeat. He drops his staff and walks toward a door while his castle is being destroyed. Before entering, he promised that he would rise again in 1000 years and reclaim his throne. And so, he sealed his own soul in the Grand Mausoleum. 1000 years later we then see two girls exploring the castle ruins of Leonis. Celia and Regina are on a mission to scout the ruins, because they have reports that some monsters called Voids are building their nests there. They walk through a corridor and reach a huge door. Celia recognizes it as the King's Mausoleum, where Demon Lord Kings decide to rest waiting for their final days. Celia then notices some writings on the door and touches it. Suddenly, the door activates and opens up. She picks up her gun and steps inside, where she finds a huge crystal. She then realizes there's a person inside and decides to help him. We then see Leonis in a barren place. He sees Roselia, the god he once made a promise to. He says that he finally has found her, and she replies that it's been over 1000 years since they met. Leonis explains he couldn't do anything against the god powers given to the heroes, so he decided to seal his soul to keep his promise to her. 
She replies that she's happy that he still remembers it and walks away into the air. Leonis tries to stop her, but she simply says she hopes to meet him again. Meanwhile, Celia is trying to shoot the crystal to rescue Leonis, who's the person inside. He complains about the noise and wonders if it's been 1,000 years already. He guesses the reincarnation ritual was successful. Leonis then notices Celia trying to shoot the crystal. He realizes she's human and thinks she's trying to rob his grave. So, he decides to show her the power of the reincarnated demon lord. He uses his magic to shatter the crystal and knock her down. He then decides to finish her by trying to rob his grave. But he stops when she asks why a kid would be locked inside the crystal. He looks at his reflections and is shocked to see his new form. He thinks the reincarnation spell failed. But he doesn't understand why because he used a spell to rebuild his body to a previous form. He expected to be in his demon lord form, but he is now in his human form when he was still a hero. The girl asks him why he was sealed inside the crystal and checks him out to make sure he's not hurt. She then suddenly hugs him telling him that Big Sister is there to protect him. He initially gets annoyed but eventually ends up falling fainting. He later wakes up and she gives him some cookies. He thinks that his current body is bad because he fainted from something trivial like hunger. But luckily, Celia saved him. She then asks if he's fine introducing herself as a 15-year-old student from the Holy Swordsman Rearing Institute, and asks for his name. Leonis introduces himself and thinks he can use her to get information about the current world. She repeats his name sometimes and calls it cute. He gets annoyed because his name once meant chaos and terror. But now, a random girl calls it cute. He then realizes that his record as the demon lord was deleted from history. She asks for his age, and he replies that he's 10. She then asks if he remembers the void monsters that had taken him away, but he's confused. She then explains that voids are enemies from another world, and that she and her school colleagues are knights who wield swords to fight them off. Leonis is initially confused because 1,000 years ago, the enemies of the world were people like him, Demon Lord and the Goddess of Rebellion. He realizes that she found him by coincidence, but she said that the door was sealed until she touched it. He then asks her what year it is. She says they're in year 64, which confuses him. They suddenly hear a big explosion. Celia immediately holds onto Leonis, stating she will protect him. An ogre void comes through the door and Celia tries to shoot it down. He gets all annoyed they're destroying his grand mausoleum and decides to use his magic to stop it. Just to trip and fall flat on his face. She tells him to back down and shoots the void, but it only tickles him. Suddenly, a laser beam destroys the void's arm and shoots its body down. It's Regina and her huge cannon. The void gets up and Regina changes her cannon form to shoot it in the chest. Despite being surprised to see Linus, Regina simply tells Celia to take away and escape while she holds the void down. The two run away, and Linus thinks nothing went according to his plan. His reincarnation spell failed and he reverted to his human form before he became a demon lord. His grand mausoleum is now infested by aliens, who are destroying everything. He wants to deal with them, but he can't because the girls are there. And if he shows his power, he won't be able to use Celia to get more information about the world. Celia then says they're about to reach the surface, but a crystal suddenly collapses on the ground and turns into a wyvern void. This is nothing like the wyverns he's used to. Celia tells Linus to run away while she deals with the monster. Her gun then turns into a sword and she prepares to deal with it. But Linus simply ignores it and starts casting his spell to destroy the monster. Celia for some reason pushes Linus away, telling him to run and get sliced in the gut. She lays on the floor in a pool of her blood and Linus wonders why she did it. She says her last words, telling him to run and escape with Regina. But Linus gets closer to her. The wyvern gets closer and a second void appears. She apologizes for not protecting him and closes her eyes. Linus holds her hand until her last breath but thinks she's an idiot. He only kept her to gain more information, but she decided to sacrifice herself to protect him. In fact, he could have used his power to easily block the wyvern's weak attack. He wanted more information, but he didn't think she had value to him anymore. However, she reminded him of Rosalia when she protected him. More voids appear and try to attack him, but his magic barrier manages to block it all. He thinks it's annoying to have his human form because he regained his emotions. The voids continue to unleash attacks, all parried away. He then turns around and summons his staff. He tells the voids that he grew attached to Celia's courage and decides to punish the voids for disturbing his castle. He casts a level 8 gravity spell, smashing a void with the pressure. Another void tries to attack but he simply blocks it with his barrier and modifies it to attack with spikes. The last void starts flying away to escape, but he simply jumps and casts another level 8 fire spell to fry it down. However, there was something he didn't expect. 
The Void's bones remained after using the spell, something that never happened even against dragons. He thinks it's because his current mana levels are a third of what they used to. He then notices Celia is just barely alive. He normally wouldn't care about human lives because he's the demon lord, but he still acknowledges her because she tried to protect him. He cannot use holy spells to heal her, but he can use all spells related to death. So, he decides to use his power to give her life. He uses a spell that restores all her lost blood into her body, healing her wounds. Meanwhile, Regina manages to finish off the ogre void and tries to contact Celia who's still unconscious. Linus hears it and finds it impressive that humanity's technology managed to advance that much. Celia then finally wakes up and immediately hugs him, relieved he's safe. She then checks her wounds and doesn't know how she's fully healed. She is confused because she's sure she died. Linus then explains he used his holy magic to heal her back, but she doesn't know what magic is. He then realizes Celia and Regina didn't use spells to fight the voids, but they used their weapons, which was made out of advanced magic. He realizes that in the current age, people can't use magic. Still confused, Celia asks if he used the power of a holy sword, but he doesn't understand. She explains that some holy swords have healing powers in the Excalibur Academy. She believes he can use that power, and believes that's why he was abducted by voids. She then gives a whole explanation of what is holy swords. Basically, their powers awakened by mankind to fight voids 60 years ago. Humanity almost lost the war against the voids, but children awaken the holy sword power to manipulate fire, wind, and others. He realizes that this power is different from the one he uses, so he decides to hide it from everyone. Regina then arrives, and the girls ask what happened to the void. Leonis lies, saying it disappeared while he was shaking in fear. They then decide to leave the ruins, and Celia asks Linus to join her on her bike, which confuses him. He joins her and they drive back to the academy, while Regina keeps teasing Linus. After a long drive, Linus has finally a view of the city, and he realizes that it's the seventh assault garden. Regina asks Linus if this is his first time seeing an assault garden. He replies with yes, describing it as incredible. She then explains that the city is docked there right now, but the city is usually in movement, as it's used on the front lines to attack void colonies. She explains the city can produce power and food and can also cross the ocean. Leonis is confused, not knowing how something this big can move. He decides that he must analyze the human forces before he starts his preparation to restore his Dark Lord's army. After getting into the city, Celia explains that people who can use the power of a holy sword must enroll in the Excalibur Academy. They aren't forced to fight the voids directly, but they must cooperate during the war. Linus thinks this is an opportunity to learn more about holy swords. The girls then say they will meet him once he finishes his inspection. After they leave, Linus steps into the bathroom and he then calls two names, Blackas and Sherry, who appear from his shadow. Sherry is his personal maid, while Blackas is his most trusted friend, the Prince of the Realm of Shadows. Linus says that it's been a while since they last met, but Blackas asks him about his new form. Linus starts petting Blackas, explaining that due to a mistake, he ended up in his original human body. Blackas mentions this is his first time seeing Linus' hero form. Sherry then finally speaks and reveals that she finds Linus' new form pretty adorable. He gets mad and asks if she's mocking him. The cute girl starts to panic, but Linus lets it off, mentioning he called them because he needs a favor. He asks them to investigate the city, explaining this is a whole different future when compared to the one he imagined. He explains people don't use magic anymore, but they have some strange power. Blackas mentions that he can smell a different type of power. Leonis then says that his goal is to regain his Dark Lord army, but they first need to know everything they can. The two then return to his shadow and start their investigation. He then goes through the inspection process, where he is sprayed with something. Some machines then start analyzing his data and he continues to walk forward. After finishing the inspection, he's given a temporary ID card. Celia appears and snatches the card from him to take a picture of it. He's a bit confused by it, but she explains that it proves his identity in the city. She then tells him it's time to visit the academy and tells him to hop on her bike. Celia takes him on a little tour around the city, showing him the huge commercial district, which shocks Linus. He mentions that everything seems peaceful in the city, which prompts an explanation from Celia. She says the seventh assault garden has never been subjected to a void invasion because it's the newest city. Yet, they're currently building a new one. She also reveals that the Holy Swordsmen are deployed to the front lines to fight, but the city is secure. However, Leonis is pretty impressed with the number of huge buildings around and asks if it's part of the academy. Sela confirms and starts to explain the buildings and what they're used for. 
The most relevant ones are the dining halls, the training grounds, and the dance hall. Leonis is a bit confused. He doesn't understand why they have a dance hall. Celia explains that it is needed to manifest his holy sword because his heart and spirit need to be calm. She shows him the girls' dormitory, but they're stopped by Musel. Linus notices that Celia is trying to avoid him, but the guy tries to stop them. He asks her who Linus is, but she simply says that Musel has nothing to do with it. The guy starts mocking Celia. He laughs and says that Celia's platoon is now accepting kids because they're all failures. Celia says that Linus is a certified holy swordsman but the guy tells her to stop joking. Linus on the other hand, thinks this guy was blessed with ignorance. He knows that he might look harmless because he looks like a kid, so he decides to not punish this guy to avoid any attention. Musel then tells Celia to stop trying to be a holy sword user and join his platoon. He claims they're the top rankers and if she joins, she will be allowed to stay in the academy. He smirks while calling her a failure who cannot manifest the holy sword despite carrying the blood of holy swordsmen. Celia lowers her head, accepting reality, but Leonis is pretty confused that she cannot manifest the holy sword. He then remembers that she couldn't use that power in the ruins, and that's why she took the hit to protect him. He then questions what she's doing in a school for holy swordsmen. Musel then shows his real personality. He tells her to come to his platoon and become his toy, like the other girls. This way, she will avoid going on dangerous missions. Linus thinks the guy is using some mind control magic on the girls. But he then realizes that must be the power of Musel's holy sword. Celia declines, making the guy mad. She then tries to continue on her way with Linus, but the guy gives in to his emotions and starts grabbing her hair. Linus tells Musel to stop, but the guy is simply confused. Leonis then releases a spell and Musel's body starts shaking in fear, not knowing what's going on. He gets onto his knees in pain and Leonis gets close to him. Leonis gets close to Musel's ear and tells him some words. He claims that Celia is his woman and that Musel has no right to touch her. Leonis stops using his magic, giving Musel the opportunity to activate his holy sword. However, another student arrives and says that using the Holy Sword's power without authorization is against the Academy's rules. The situation is even worse because he's in the sector of the girl's dorm. Musel starts walking away before wetting his pants. Leonis then thinks to himself that he cannot believe that he got worked up because of a stupid fly, but he doesn't regret it. He considers himself the most forgiving of all Dark Lords, but Celia is one of his minions. Meanwhile, Celia is all happy and thanks the girl for helping them. The girl is Elphine and mentions that seems like Musel is eyeing Celia up. She then asks if Linus is the boy she saved on the ruins. And Linus notices something. Celia's friends are filled with huge plots. Elphine explains she is Celia's platoon operator, making Linus realize that they've always been in communication. Leo introduces himself and Elphine welcomes him to the academy. She then gives him his uniform and asks Celia if they will register his holy sword. Celia says that Linus first needs a shower and asks if Elphine is heading to the dormitory. Elphine explains she first needs to submit the void investigation data to the knights, mentioning there's something under the ocean. Linus gets curious about it but ignores it for now. But Elphine stops explaining the situation because Celia is starting to feel dizzy. Linus realizes it's almost time and they head to her team's dormitory. Celia explains the assigned dorms are based on the platoon's grades. She explains each platoon has five or six members, and the academy treats them on a merit system. There are tournaments, practice matches, and examinations to decide the ranks of each platoon. She explains her team's dorm has air conditioning, new training equipment, a jet bath and a sauna. Linus thinks a jet bath is a weapon, but she tells him to get in. He then asks if it's okay for him to enter a girl's dorm, but she says that he's too little, so they wouldn't care. She starts making herself at home, and Linus is confused because she has no sense of shame. She tells him to take a bath and he follows her orders. Suddenly, Celia also comes in. She has no real sense of shame boys. She then starts to feel weaker and falls. Linus touches his spell mark placed on her body. Her eyes suddenly turn crimson red and her canine teeth get bigger. She tries to reach him with her hand, and he pulls her into him. Upon getting up, she bites onto his neck and starts to feel better. She's confused as to why she had bitten him, but he decides to tell her the truth. He had to use his magic to turn her into his strongest minion, a vampire queen. She gets confused but he explains that in reality, she is already dead. Later, Celia wakes up on her bed, confused about what happened. Linus explains that she collapsed due to lack of mana, and he had to give her some of his. She doesn't understand what he's trying to say and asks about Linus' real identity. He simply says that he's an ancient sorcerer who resurrected from the crystal, and that he uses powers that have been already forgotten. 
He also shares that his sorcery can only control death, and he can't really heal or revive her. Linus reveals he used a level 10 spell named Create Elder Undead. To be fair, he wasn't even sure the spell would work. However, she came back as the strongest of all undead minions, the Vampire Queen. She gets worried about being a vampire, but Leonis explains that she lacked mana, so she had to drink some of his blood due to her vampiric impulses. She believes his story, and he apologizes for not being able to properly save her. She asks if she can share her story, and Leonis agrees to listen. She tells him what happened six years ago, how she lost her city to a void attack, along with her parents. She says that her parents were both holy sword users, who tried their best to protect the city. However, she feels sad because she had to be in a shelter with Regina. Since then, she's been training to awaken the Holy Sword and fight voids. She then asks him if she can still manifest a Holy Sword, but he doesn't know about it. He simply tells her that she's now a lot stronger because of her vampire queen nature. She's still a bit worried, but the mood changes when Lena's stomach makes some noise. She laughs it off and mentions that he has already spent more time in a girl's room when compared to eating. They head to the cafeteria where she asks if she can still eat normal food because she's now a vampire. Linus replies she can because she's a high-ranking one. She will recover mana from eating, but it takes too much time, so it's not the most efficient way to regain her strength. They then heard a girl talking to two guys in the background. The guys complain that she isn't wearing the school's uniform and try to take advantage of the situation. When one of them grabs her, she quickly knocks them down with her wooden sword. The girl then tells them off, stating she has permission to dress like that and the guys start running. Celia quickly runs to the girl and calls her Sakuya. She asks what happened, and Sakuya explains everything. She was supposed to be in a tactical drill, but Sakuya snuck out because it was boring and decided to gamble until she got caught by those two guys. She then focuses on Linus, explaining that Elfine already mentioned him. Celia keeps her version, stating he was abducted by voids and she saved him. Sakuya then introduces herself and shakes his hand. He quickly notices that she's someone who dedicated her whole life to the sword, and wonders how much she has trained. Celia then reveals Sakuya is her platoon's vanguard attacker and ends up paying for everyone's lunch. While eating, Linus asks Sakuya why she's dressed like that. Sakuya explains that's the traditional clothing of her homeland and a memento of her sister. Her village was attacked and destroyed by voids and she was the only survivor. So now, she's training to get stronger and get her revenge. Linus apologizes for asking about such circumstances, and Sakuya explains that usually, people must wear the academy's attire. But since it's a memento from her sister, she somehow got special permission to wear it. After the meal, Celia and Linus head to the training grounds to register his holy sword. There he meets Alto, the instructor in charge of his examination. She explains she will examine him to determine what type of holy sword he has. Linus simply says he's a support who can do all sorts of stuff based on the situation. He then notices some robots around and asks about them. Celia explains those robots are void simulators. In short, they can copy void combat patterns. Alto tells Linus to fight it since it's set to the low level. He thinks a level 2 gravity spell should be enough to finish this quickly, but that ends up destroying all the robots. Celia and Alto cannot believe it. Alto questions how he crushed that robot and asks if his holy sword is really a support type. She wants to know more about it and everyone around starts looking at them. She then starts programming the void simulator to a higher level, but they're interrupted by the annoying Musel. He wants to handle the examination. Linus says he doesn't mind, but he also mocks Musel by saying he's on the same level as the robots. The guy gets so enraged that he ends up calling his holy sword Harry Potter wand. His pet girls also call up air weapons, but Celia claims that a 5 on 1 isn't fair. But Musel simply claims that his holy sword has the ability to control others as his weapon. Yet, Linus arrogantly says he will just defeat the five noobs. Celia decides to join and help him, falling into Musel's plan, because he will allow her to help Linus under one condition. If she loses, she will join his platoon and become his toy. Linus knows that Musel simply wants to clap Celia and decides to take advantage of it. He accepts that condition, but if Musel loses, he must never bother Celia again. As you know, the guy is so dumb that he ends up being overconfident and accepts. Linus tells her that he won't allow anyone to touch his girl, and Celia starts blushing. Celia then asks Alto for a training sword, a holy sword replica made for training. After setting up their positions they decided to start. Celia quickly dashes forward and knocks one of the girls down. She then goes for Musel, but another girl comes to block it. Linus simply watches, thinking that her raw attributes improved since she became a vampire queen. 
one of the other girls smashes her weapon to the ground, forcing Celia to parry the pebbles. Muzel, being the typical loser, tells one of his pets to deal with Leonis while Celia is distracted. The girl rushes forward and attacks with lightning, but Leonis simply uses a low-level spell to block it with his shadow, and then he uses it to restrain the girl. Celia then starts getting the advantage against the two girls she's fighting against. The third comes forward, but Celia takes her down. Celia then decides to deal with Muzel, but he simply uses his wand to stop her from moving. She's a bit confused about what's happening, but he explains this is his real power, the Holy Sword of Dominion. He knocks the sword out of her hands and explains all the dirty things he will do to her later. But first, he decides to deal with Leonis who's a bit cornered. He's still restraining the first girl, but the other three got up and are surrounding him, four now with Muzel. Leonis thinks he could use a level 2 spell and wipe them out in an instant, but he suddenly hears Celia. She's talking to herself, mentioning how much she wants to protect him. She then begs her holy sword to appear. Her strong desire makes a bright light appear on her hands. The light then transforms into a holy sword. Regina, who was watching, could not believe her eyes. With her holy sword, Celia manages to break free from the restraints. Muzel is clearly your loser who cannot believe what's happening, giving Celia the chance to rush forward. She destroys his wand in half, releasing all the girls in his control. Without any other option, he gives up like the little loser he is. Everyone starts cheering for Celia, including Regina, who immediately hugs her. She's so happy that she managed to awaken her power, and Celia can barely believe she managed to do it. Later, she thanks Linus for helping her. She laughs it off and promises to protect him. She pats him and decides to ask him for a favor. She wants him to make her stronger and asks him to join her platoon. He quickly accepts the deal. They throw a welcoming party, where Regina cooks a huge feast. Elfine then tells Linus to come to her room so she can analyze his skills, and that drives the real conversation to begin. There are no more open rooms in their dorm, so Linus will have to stay with someone. Regina quickly jumps into the conversation. She wants that clap session. She even promises to make him sweets every day. Sakuya also wants a piece of that, despite being out most of the day. Elfine joins, stating she has tons of plot in her room. Leonis has so many options, but Celia jumps in between. She considers herself his guardian, therefore she will make sure he's cozy at night. The girls suspect something, but Leonis mentions he'd rather stay with Celia. Not because the winter is cold, but because that will allow the two of them to keep their secrets. Especially because she will need to get mana from his blood. As promised, Leonis goes to Elfine's room to be examined. She uses her holy sword eye of the witch to scan his data. Leonis is impressed about it but she explains that she lost her holy sword powers and her capabilities are now limited. She reveals she was part of the 7th platoon. They were investigating some ruins and were attacked by voids. By the time they realized it was a trap, it was too late. The group fell apart and she was the only survivor. She then lost most of her power and shut herself in her room. But Celia visited her so much that she accepted to join the platoon. She then finishes scanning his biological data and finds something interesting. It says that Linus enjoys staring at plot. She tells him that being naughty isn't good. He then notices a map on her monitor and asks if he can check it. She agrees and gives him a tablet with the map. While checking it, Linus notices the void distribution area over the last few months. He then calls forth Blackas and finds out from him that the voids have similar characteristics to the monsters the Dark Lords used against mankind. He then orders Blackas to investigate the spots presented on the map. Blackas disappears and Sherry suddenly appears. She also has a report. People don't know about any demon lord. They don't even know about ancient gods or the war between the Dark Lords and the six heroes from a thousand years ago. He asks her to continue her investigation. Meanwhile, there's a group of divers investigating the underwater ruins. They find a huge tree with a face. The tree starts calling Linus' name and attacks the divers. The next day, Linus wakes up and notices his neck has been bitten. He immediately gets into Celia's room and orders her to get up. Since his minion, she immediately gets up, confused about what he did. He shows her the master contract mark, explaining he can simply order her around, and she cannot refuse his orders. She suddenly gets flustered and asks if he can also literally order her to do plot actions. Leonis explains that he won't order her to do those kinds of things. She rests assured, deciding to believe that Leonis will always be trustful. Leonis then changes the topic, asking if she sucked his blood while he was asleep. She gets shy, mentioning she sucked a little because she couldn't help herself in the middle of the night. Leonis replies that he doesn't mind about it because she's his minion. However, she should first say something to him. She understands and apologizes to him. They're then interrupted when her phone starts ringing. 
Celia picks up Elphine's call and asks her the reason for the sudden call. Elphine then reports there is something strange. The 13th platoon should be investigating the seabed, but they haven't returned yet. They're known for being a skilled group, but there is no news yet. Elphine says she will continue investigating the case and will give her an update later. Celia then mentions Linus promised that he would train her, and he agrees to head to the training grounds. Meanwhile, the Excalibur's Academy staff is having a meeting. They're pretty worried about the 13th platoon and ask about their collected data. They find out there's a Void colony in the seabed beneath the Assault City. They think the Voids will probably attack the city in a large group. One of the staff members asks how many Voids could be found in the colony. But the answer is worried. Several hundred, if not more. They become worried because there's a huge chance that a Void Lord will appear in this attack. In the meantime, Celia is practicing her skills against two robots. But it's quite easy for her, especially because they come one at a time. Linus compliments her skills and asks her if she has someone to teach her swordsmanship. Celia reveals that her family taught her the basics when she was young, and since then, she's always been practicing, but her progress is now slow. Linus then mentions that she now should be stronger because she's also a vampire queen. She can barely believe it. Linus explains that she's not used to using the vast mana reserves on her body. He tells her that if she manages to learn how to use it, her strength will be increased by a lot. She asks for his guidance and Linus summons his staff. He says that he will give her a more realistic opponent and casts a barrier around. He then uses a summoning spell to create several skeleton soldiers from the shadow. She is confused, but he simply explains those are his lowest ranking minions, and that she is free to destroy them however she wishes. She then decides to start and starts slicing the skeletons one by one. She dodges when two skeletons attack her from both sides, and Linus takes this chance to summon even more soldiers. After some minutes, Linus notices her tired and decides to stop. He returns his skeletons to the shadows and asks if she needs him to give her some mana. She says that she's fine, and he compliments her skills again. He then decides to return to the dorm, but she asks him if he wants to have a meal with her. He refuses to, but his stomach makes some noise. She starts laughing, and he gets annoyed with his body. Meanwhile, Sakuya was stepping out of the dorm when she noticed Black is outside. She likes his appearance so much that runs toward him. She thinks that he has a noble aura and decides to give him a name until she finds his owner. She calls him Fluffamaru the Black. Of course, Black as hates that name, but she simply ignores it, thinking he likes it. She decides to warp his neck with a piece of cloth, mentioning it has food inside. She then walks away, mentioning they will meet again. Meanwhile, inside Elfine is trying to get more data when both Regina and Sakuya get in. Sakuya is pretty hyped up, mentioning how she just met Blackas. They then focus on the new investigation, as a new group is sent to locate the Void Lord. However, they haven't returned yet, this was an even better group than last time. We then return to Celia and Linus. They're cruising through the city on her bike, heading to get their lunch. But the two later stop by an orphanage. Linus is confused, but Celia explains that it's a restaurant and an orphanage. The orphans quickly step outside, happy to see Celia. She then explains that this place takes care of refugee children with nowhere to turn. Somehow, Linus can resonate a bit with these children because he also was a homeless orphan before becoming the hero. Upon getting inside, Celia apologizes because she couldn't visit them earlier due to her exams. One of the kids sneaks behind her to do something interesting. But Linus gets mad that someone is doing that to his minion. He uses his magic to attack the kid but stops when Celia tells him that it's fine. The owner of the place comes down, she's Frenia. She introduces her to Leo, explaining he's a boy she saved in the ruins. She tells her that he's also a holy swordsman, which makes all the kids cling to him, thinking he's amazing. Celia then tells them that she brought some vegetables and donuts for the kids. The kids get all happy and Frenia mentions she will be preparing lunch soon. Meanwhile, Sakuya wakes up from her nap with a strange feeling. Turns out that there are some vines growing inside the control room of the Assault City. We see Ericale's monster form manage to infiltrate the underground in the Assault City. Meanwhile, in the HQ of the Assault City, there's a report that the huge tree has gone missing. They wonder if it's a void and are determined to deal with it when they find it. They then contact Elfine and allow her to explain the results of her analysis. She explains that she detected something underground in District 62. She also explains that at the same time, there was a magic energy reaction. She then reveals the same occurred minutes later, and after analyzing all the data, she concludes it was caused by a void. Everyone starts to panic, unable to believe a void managed to infiltrate the underground facilities. The data team analyzes the new info with their previous one and explains it's true. The old man is confused and asks why their void detection machine didn't give them any signal. 
the analyst explains the void produced weak magic waves, therefore the machine didn't react because it was considered a common accident. Suddenly, an alarm rings and the analyst explains something was detected moving in District 31. The old man is confused again, asking why that thing isn't releasing magic. Elfine quickly concludes the void is limiting its power to avoid being detected. The old man rejects that possibility because voids aren't smart. But Elfine bluntly asks him if they found any hints about what happened to the last investigation team. Another alarm rings, this time, a report from the stock department. The report states they have found some tree roots in that section. Meanwhile, in Elfine's room, Regina is worried because she cannot contact Celia. Elfine asks if she knows where Celia is and Regina replies that she must be in the orphanage with Leonis. Elfine tracks them through GPS, but Regina asks her if voids did really infiltrate the city. Elfine simply replies yes and tells Regina and Sakuya to stay alert. Meanwhile at the orphanage, the kids are all enjoying their lunch when one of them asks Leonis to show him his holy sword. Leonis is clearly annoyed because this stupid kid just spit on his face. However, there's a kid girl named Chaisla who calms the kid down and gives Leonis her handkerchief. Leonis sees her as a kind and well-educated child, but she's clearly crushing on him. She shyly calls him cool for being able to use a holy sword and quickly rushes back to her tomato land. Back at the headquarters, they manage to find some hints about what's happening. Not only did they manage to find some footsteps, but they also found a corridor full of tree roots. The men there await orders to destroy those roots. Suddenly, those roots start to inflate and show some sort of eyes. In the next instant, all men are attacked, and they lose communication. The general now believes it's a void but wonders how it managed to get into the underground. Things get worse when the analyst reveals the roots managed to cut the communication system within the city. Harry Fatter starts to use his iPad to hack the system and re-establishes some communication. Two guys manage to survive the last attack. However, they let the void escape. Not only that, but they cannot track the void at the moment. The general freaks out because void usually attacks non-stop but this one ran away. The analysts quickly realize the Void paved his way through the energy corridor but don't know why. Elfine quickly realizes its goal is the magic energy core that sustains the city. She quickly explains that if it's a Void Lord, then it will use the magic energy core to create a huge stampede. Everyone freaks out, ordering to protect the magic core and activate all defensive systems. However, seconds later, the tree roots breach the walls and try to reach the core. The defensive system starts shooting the roots down, while the troops arrive. However, the defense system is taking some losses. They quickly decide to change their priority to not only defend the core, but they also order the citizens to be evacuated, while everyone else prepares to face a stampede. Meanwhile at the orphanage, this ugly disgusting kid is still insisting on seeing Leonis Holy Sword. The soldiers are still trying to deal with the roots, but they stop once they reach the magic core. It quickly forces its way in and starts summoning voids. The city alarm quickly starts to ring, making Celia and Linus rush outside. They realize a stampede is striking their city. The city's defense system activates, using the reserve energy but it will take three days for them to get any external help. Elfine, Sakuya, and Regina help to evacuate the citizens, but the latter is still worried about Celia. Elfine assures that Celia should arrive there soon, as she should follow the normal procedures. But their focus for now is to deal with the voids in the area. The sky is filled with voids, but the defensive system's machine guns start to quickly deal with them. The girls then reach a rooftop, where each of them starts summoning their holy swords and attacking. Meanwhile, Linus is watching this from afar, thinking the void humanoids are quite strong. Celia then starts to panic and returns inside, stating they must evacuate the kids. Linus tries to follow but he's interrupted by Sherry, who asks for his orders. Linus tells her to protect his familiars. Sherry tries to refuse, saying she wants to protect him, but he simply tells her to go away. Celia then calls for Linus, explaining the kids are ready to evacuate. However, Linus notices something and tells her it's dangerous outside. A dragon void is in the area, and Celia heads outside to deal with them. She summons her holy sword, but Linus notices she hasn't reached her real power as a vampire queen. When asked if she's afraid, she replies yes, but she cannot leave in fear and leave the kids to perish. He smiles and decides to summon his staff, decided to not let his strongest familiar die. Two voids attack, but Celia quickly deals with them. She then notices two others burning in the air and realizes it's Linus doing. She asks if this is his power, but he simply focuses on the next targets. More and more voids start to appear around the city. Sakuya notices some ogres and dashes in with her sword, making them barbecue minced meat. 
Regina uses her huge cannon to shoot dragons down, while Elfine uses her stuff to scout the area. Suddenly, they feel the ground shaking and they notice a huge void hydra. Linus then looks at the voids and realizes it's monsters from 1000 years ago. Even the great dragons were corrupted and became voids. He quickly realizes that if they're as strong as they were back in time, he cannot use low-level spells. He tells Celia to protect him while he casts a high-level spell. She quickly rushes ahead to deal with several voids, enabling Leonis to start casting his spell. However, he doesn't really know why he's doing this. He, the great demon lord, shouldn't care about the destruction of a human city. However, he cannot stay still when someone tries to challenge him and his family. A huge dragon appears in front of him, and Linus casts his level 10 spell. Several fireballs appear in the air and crash in the area. Celia is scared because it's raining fireballs, but Linus tells her to stay still. He manages to pin the dragon down, but it attacks Celia with fire. She dodges it, and Linus starts to blame his current body for his low level of power. Suddenly, Blackas appears from the shadow and bites the dragon's neck. Linus uses this chance to cast another level 10 gravity spell, smashing the dragon to the floor. Celia cannot believe she saw Linus defeat such a huge void. Yet, suddenly, the floor starts shaking and collapsing. The three roots appear once again, and they restrain Celia. She's slowly pulled inside the hole. Linus tries to help her, but some roots block his path. The roots then start taking some shape and call for his name. Linus smiles and recognizes the roots as Arakel, one of the former heroes. Linus mentions he didn't expect to meet Arakel 1000 years later. He summons his staff and casts a spell. Still, the tree dude doesn't fight him head on and returns underground. Linus realizes Celia is still alive as the mark hasn't disappeared yet. Blackus comes out of the shadows to talk about Arakel and how he's changed after his resurrection. Blackus notices the kids from the orphanage looking at Linus. He wonders why they put themselves in danger and asks him if he has something to do with them. Linus thinks they are afraid of his power. He approaches them, telling them to return to the shelter but they thank him for protecting them. They beg him to rescue Celia, surprised they aren't afraid of him. He assures them he will rescue her. He erects a barrier and summons skeleton guards to protect them. Linus walks back to Blackus who picks up the sound of Celia's communication device. Elfine and Regina are facing off the Hydra and want Celia's backup. But Linus tells them that Celia has been kidnapped. He tells Elfine to get Celia's location using her holy sword but she tells him to wait for their help. Linus tells her there is no time and gives her a view of the area where Celia was kidnapped. Elfine manages to find her location and tells Linus. Suddenly, Elfine is about to be attacked by the Hydra, but she is protected by Sherry. While heading to Celia's location, Blackus asks Linus why he sent Sherry to help the humans. Linus tries giving Blackus excuses, but Blackus isn't convinced. Linus finally confesses to taking a slight liking to the human and Blackus is pleased with his answer. Linus uses his magic to break the door leading to the room holding Celia. They both burst into the room where they find the branch dude. Erikel is holding Celia hostage and Linus tells him it's time to return his minion. Linus launches his flame magic which burns the vines. But Erikel regenerates quickly and asks Linus how he's still alive. Linus tells him he never perished but he just sealed his soul 1000 years ago. Erikel tells him the world has changed since then. He claims the world needs to be rebuilt, along with the empty star. Linus asks him about the empty star. Erikel tells him he has been chosen to be a bringer of good tidings. Several eyes open from Erikel's branches making Linus realize that Erikel defeated the priests of the Sacred Order. Linus calls out to Celia and she responds to him from behind the main branch of Erikel. She is being restrained by strong vines. While Linus is distracted, Erikel tries to attack him. But Blackus warns him, and he can dodge in time. They run around the room dodging Erikel's attacks. Linus summons ice to cut through the branches. But the monster regenerates too quickly. He tries to attack Linus while he's off guard, but Blackus protects him. Blackus notices their magic is becoming weaker with each second and Linus tells it's because they're in Erikel's domain. Erikel casts a spell to increase the number of spells cast at once. He then creates multiple beams of light that ricochet around the room. Linus gets hit by a beam and tries to combine his magic attack with Blackus. However, Erikel creates a light barrier to protect himself. Blackus tells Linus that Erikel has unlimited power because he's absorbing it from the mana crystal. Linus tells Blackus it's time to take a little risk. Meanwhile, Celia tries to break free from the branches restraining her, but it only injures her body. Despite the pain, she refuses to give up and let Linus fight alone. 
She summons her holy sword and tries to cut the branches, but she can't make a movement. Outside, Erikel keeps attacking Linus with his light magic. Linus and Blackus combine to cast a powerful spell. Still, Erikel creates a light magic barrier to counter it. Celia is still struggling against vines, increasing the injuries in her body. Her eyes turn red, and some sort of blades come out from her blood. The blades cut through the branches, allowing Linus to find her precise location. He then throws her communication device covered in his blood, piercing her chest. And with that, Celia finally gets free from the vines, awakening as a true vampire queen. She cuts through the branch in front of her and returns to Linus' side. Blackus tells Linus he needs time to recuperate and steps aside. Linus reunites with Celia and he praises her for mastering her vampire powers. She thanks him for supplying her with mana so she can join the fight. Erikel heals his wounds and tells Linus he will crush him to dust. Root Guy casts a huge light magic with his multiple spell chanting skill. Blackus realizes the tree wants to take the whole city by casting multiple level 10 spells, but Linus won't allow it. He tells Celia he's going to take Erikel down and asks for her protection. Linus tries to draw his demon sword and Blackus asks him if he remembers what that implies. Linus remembers the instruction from Roselia years ago. He can only draw out the demon sword under one specific condition, to protect his kingdom. With that in mind, Linus draws the sword, declaring this land and people as his kingdom. He recites the sword's instruction, and it acknowledges Linus' decision. Erikel tells Linus he can't change the destiny of the world, but our boy tells him he'll rip through the fabrics of destiny with his own two hands. Linus uses his secret sword technique, making Erikel disappear. All the voids begin to disappear and the stampede ceases. The next day, Linus cannot move from bed because of his sore muscles. Turns out the power of the sword is overbearing for his undeveloped body. Linus wakes up the next day with sore muscles. Celia comes into his room, bringing him a present from the kids. She tells him that welding her holy sword consumed a lot of blood and she would like to replenish it. He teases her about her self-control, and she tells her she can have a little. However, the girls step into his room and find them in this situation. Celia explains to them that it's just a big misunderstanding. In the aftermath, the city was devastated by the stampede but it's slowly being rebuilt. Since the power plant was destroyed, solar panels were built to produce mana. Linus tries to access the information vault, but a spirit tells him he needs permission. Linus is surprised that spirit still exists and claims to be a student at the academy. Regina closes his eyes from behind and plays a game of guess who, but Linus guesses correctly. He pulls away, telling her they are in public. He asks her if she tailed him just to tease him, but she tells him she came to return something and bumped into him by accident. He tells her he came to do some research on an ancient language. He tells her he hopes the language will help him recover his memories as an excuse. She feels for him and assures him she will grant him access. She approaches the spirit and asks it to let them through. The spirit tells her she doesn't have permission, but she uses a trick to make it grant them access. Regina tells Linus to keep her trick secret. Linus finds out the spirit is man-made and asks Regina what happened to the original spirits. She tells him there are rumors that they lurk in forests. She finds references for the ancient language in the vault and points Linus at them, telling him he can only read the books in the vault. They get a message from the administration inviting them to the commendation ceremony. Hosted by Alteria, the Imperial Princess, Linus is happy about it because he can use royalty as an excuse to ask questions about the human empire. He gets a call from Celia asking him where he is. He tells her he went on an errand but will meet her at the harbor. Regina leaves him in the vault. Meanwhile, in the outskirts, a black lion called Bastia tells his gang will kidnap Alteria during the ceremony. Rakt agrees with him, saying they can use her to bargain for the freedom of their imprisoned brethren. Jurder is angry the human locked them up. Elza asks Bastia if they would be able to hold up against the holy swords of the humans. Jurder starts arguing with her and Bastia tries to calm them down. A stranger tells them they lack solidarity. Jurder asks her why she is mocking them, and she tells him she's offering her assistance because she shares their resentment. Rakt asks her if she would help them capture the princess, and she tells them she will give them powers greater than a holy sword. She brings forth a demon sword and gives Bastia great power which allows him to make his own demon sword. Rakt confuses it for a holy sword, but the stranger tells her it's a demon sword that can be wielded by anyone. Elza is impressed and thinks their kidnapping attempt could be successful with such power. The stranger tells them anyone else who is strong enough will also get a demon sword. She suggests they hijack the Hyperion and kidnap the princess. Jurder says if they steal the ship, 
they can sail straight to free their jailed partners. The stranger asks them for a favor in return for the demon swords. She tells them to deliver the swordsmen to her so they can be used as a sacrifice to the goddess. They agree to her terms. Bastia asks him for her name and she introduces herself as Sharnak the Witch of the Everdark Forest. Meanwhile, Linus arrives at the harbor, impressed by the battleship docked there. Linus decides to get Celia a gift and is impressed when the vendor tells him the elves make it. Linus asks him about the elves and the vendor explains the diversity of people who reside in the city. Princess Almeria stands on the battleship to greet the people gathered at the harbor. Her guard tells her she shouldn't stand too close to the edge. She apologizes telling him she was looking for someone. Celia and the rest of the platoon meet up with Linus. He gives her the gift he bought for her as thanks for saving his life. She thanks him for the gift, telling him it's adorable. She tells him it's time they board the ship and meet with the princess. Linus asks about Regina, but they tell her she won't be attending the ceremony. Suddenly a student named Fenris calls out to Celia asking her what she's doing at the harbor. Celia tells her they were invited to the commendation ceremony. Fenris tells her she is busy all the time because she is on the student council. They begin to argue but Elfine breaks it up. Fenris tells Celia she heard she awakened her holy sword and congratulates her. Linus asks Celia about Fenris and she tells him they are some sort of childhood friends. Meanwhile, Bastia and his gang infiltrate the ship. They take down guards and steal their faces to take their human appearance. They commend the plan of Sharnak for working so well thus far. The ceremony begins, but Linus sits down, looking through a copy of the history books. He notices some missing information which indicates someone was trying to hide the events of the past. Sherry appears and he asks her what she has discovered. She gives him information about the ship, and he presents her with a gift, which she isn't too pleased with it. She takes it anyway and disappears into the shadow world. Later in the day, it's almost time for the princess's speech. She is being led by her guards, but they are ambushed by Bastia and his accomplice disguised as staff. They take the princess hostage, but she releases the master key, and the pierced creature runs away. The rest of the demi-human gang surrounds the people gathered for the speech. They confiscate their phone and keep them in check with a bomb. They ask the demi-humans what they want, and they ask for the release of their partners in prison. But Fenris tells them they don't negotiate with terrorists. He tells Fenris they will be sacrificed to the goddess. Linus tells Celia he wants to make sure of the princess's safety and disappears into the shadow world. Bastia and his crew force her to activate the ship and head towards the capital. She tells them they would be heading towards a cluster of voids. Bastia asks her to steer around it, but Sharnak tells her to head straight at it, so the holy knights are tainted to make them all suitable as sacrifices. Bastia finally sees her true intentions and tries to fight her, but she subdues him. The guards of the harbor notice the ship start moving and try to stop it. The pierced creature meets with Regina, who identifies it as the royal family's carbuncle, and delivers the message calling for help. She jumps back on the ship and bumps into Leonis who seems lost. She tells him her little sister is in danger. Regina then starts explaining to Leonis about her background plot. She introduces herself again, this time as the fourth princess of the Ordelese Empire, and Alteria is her younger sister. She explains that on the day she was born, an unlucky star appeared in the sky. And for some reason, there's a strange law for royal children who are born under that star. In short, the kid needs to either be deleted or locked up in a monastery in the mountains for the rest of their lives. Celia's grandfather, however, was unhappy with how Regina was being treated. So, he decided to take her in, and that's how she became Celia's maid and friend. She then mentions there's a chance that the assailants have taken her sister to control the ship. Linus is confused, but she reveals the royal family are holders of the power of the spirits, and the ship's navigation system is an artificial elemental, which can only be commanded by royal blood. In short, Alteria is the Hyperion itself. With that information, Linus decides to recapture the princess. He mentions Celia and the others should be fine despite being held hostage in the hall. Regina gets shocked, but Linus replies they're the ones who can do it. He thinks the carbuncle should know the way to the main bridge, and Regina lets the spirit lead their way. Meanwhile, at the party hall, Fenris tries to talk to the beastmen, asking how they even got there. But the wolf guy smiles, mentioning he they just used his holy sword. Elfine takes this chance to tell Celia that she already analyzed the bomb. Celia is a bit confused about how she did it, and Elfine explains she hid her holy sword behind the chandelier. She then reveals the bomb isn't reactive type. That means that the Holy Sword user must send magic power to activate it. The only problem is that it cannot be neutralized, only delayed. And to add more salt to the injury, she can only delay it for only one second. Celia thinks that if they work together, they can easily deactivate the bomb. 
She looks around and notices a fork. She decides to poke it into her finger, making her bleed to activate her vampire queen power. Meanwhile, Regina and Linus manage to reach the main bridge, but it's empty. Well, technically is filled with corpses. Linus wonders where they took the princess. Regina then picks up Carbuncle, mentioning there's a chance where they can create a link to talk with Alteria. However, she isn't sure if she can form that link. Linus tells her that she can do it because he believes in her. After all, she wants to protect her little sister. She returns to her relaxed state and decides to give it a try. She holds the carbuncle and concentrates, trying to talk to the princess. The princess replies, asking who Regina is. She lies about her identity, mentioning she also can use spirit power and asks where the princess is. The princess simply means she's being taken away and begs Regina to focus on saving the people inside the ship instead. The princess then mentions the terrorists have set the course of Hyperion to avoid Black Reef, and reveals their only way to stop the ship from reaching this destination is by taking the carbuncle to the bridge. Regina then explains everything to Linus, who immediately asks her where's the princess. Regina reveals Alteria's location but is worried because if they choose to save her, everyone else will be left alone to their destiny. However, Linus simply tells her to stop the ship because he will save the princess. She refuses to let him go alone because he's just a child. Linus ignores her words and uses magic to destroy the window. He tells her that he's a lot stronger than she thinks, so they should focus on their missions. He jumps down while Regina tells him to save his sister. Meanwhile, at the party hall, we see that Celia is trying to use her vampire powers to control her blood. She manages to create a thin line of blood, all the way to the guy controlling the bomb. She tells Elfine to prepare herself to delay the bomb. However, Fenris never shuts up and starts blabbering toward the wolf guy. The wolf dude gets as annoyed as I am and threatens to slice her neck off. When suddenly, Sakuya somehow managed to free herself and dropped a plate. The terrorist cannot understand how this chick is still eating some bread and asks how she got rid of the ropes. She simply replies she used the knife on the table. Wolf guy gets annoyed and paths toward her, but Ogre Girl reasons that Sakuya's aura is quite intense. Once again, Fenris gets up and opens her mouth. Selly uses this opportunity to control her blood again and prepare for their attack. The wolf dude doesn't wait, he attacks Fenris, who somehow manages to dodge, pulls out some judo moves, and restrains the guy on the floor. Wolf guy isn't happy about it and tells the other dude to blow the apple. Elfine uses her ball to delay the spell, enabling Celia to use her blood and destroy the guy's wand. Sakuya follows up by pinning Ogre Girl against the table, and Fenris summons her ice wolves to freeze the wolf dude. Celia takes this chance to summon her holy sword to attack the guy and finally destroy the apple. However, she has some complaints about how Fenris almost ruined their plan. Everyone quickly gets their devices but there's no signal, and somehow the atmosphere feels weird. They check through the window and see how close they are to a Void Reef. Voids start boarding the ship and attack them. Everyone knows their tasks, Elfine and Celia will help the guests get to safety. While Fenris and Sakuya defeat the monsters, Celia suddenly hears Leo's voice, but she's confused because she doesn't see him. He explains that he's using the souvenir he gave her to create a telepathy channel with her. He then reveals that Regina is heading to the bridge, but it's too dangerous for her to go alone. So, he asks Celia to help her. Meanwhile, Regina is literally surrounded by voids, but Celia manages to arrive and rescue her. The things in the party hall initially calm down, until a powerful void joins the fun. Fenris ice wolves can't do anything to him. Elfine tells them to hold off until help comes, but Sakura refuses to, claiming she will deal with the big boy. The girls take down the weaker voids and retreat to another room. She then activates her true power, the Dark Plover Demon Sword, turning the monster into ground squid. The other two finally manage to reach the bridge, and Celia says she will cover Regina's back. Regina sits down accesses the system, and inputs the code given by the princess. Turns out, it's the name of the star Regina was born. Alteria never met Regina, but she didn't want to ever forget that she had an older sister. In her thoughts, Regina thanks her sister and tries to take control of the ship's system. In the meantime, the princess is almost being taken away on a plane by Sharnak. Alteria notices the chopper managed to turn away and is happy that everyone is safe. Sharnak tries to take off, but somehow the chopper is being pulled down. She suddenly sees the voids guarding the area being wiped out by fireballs. She looks forward and sees a little boy, asking if she thought she could get away. Back on the ship, Elfine and the rest are surrounded by voids. Some kids start to cry, especially because Elfine has no more bullets to fire. One of the girls tells the rest to relax because Leonis will somehow save them. 
The monsters prepare to attack, but they're suddenly sliced into pieces. It's Sherry, who also gets the chance to get a snack and disappears from the shadows. She simply mentions this is the payment for putting their faith in her master. Meanwhile, Sharnak steps outside and asks who Leonis is. He replies that she will pay for the crime of messing with his kingdom and introduces himself as the Demon Lord. She gets annoyed, calling him just a kid mocking the name of Demon Lord. She uses a fire spell to attack, but Linus easily blocks it, calling it disappointing. Sharnak cannot believe her eyes, mentioning he just used the secret art of the legendary demon lord. Linus confirms it and uses his shadows to restrain her. He questions her objective, to which she replies is to create a demon sword. She then mentions gaining the favor of the goddess, making Linus confused. He claims that gods perished 1000 years ago and asks for its name, but swords come out of Sharnak's body just when she's about to reveal the goddess name. Leonis is confused because that was the Sword of Annihilation. Shardark's body suddenly turns into a big monster, able to summon more voids. He quickly remembers that the sword was given to him by the gods when he was a hero to kill demon lords. However, he believed that he destroyed the sword after becoming the demon lord. He attacks it with a void with fire, but the void absorbs the attack instead. The void then suddenly disappears and appears a second later on top of him. Linus manages to dodge but notices the smaller voids are trying to take the princess. He destroys them but enables the huge void to attack him. However, Regina who's controlling the ship, watches everything from the surveillance camera and activates the defense system. The ship starts shooting the void with not only bullets but also missiles. One of the missiles has Celia inside, who came to help him. More voids are summoned, and Linus asks Celia to get him some time. She cuts her own flesh to create some blades and deals with every small void around. Linus uses this chance to pull out his demon sword and uses his strongest attack to vanish the void lord away. In the aftermath, Celia, Sakuya, Elfine, and Fenris are commended by the princess for their efforts to protect everyone. Alteria, however, notices Linus is missing. Celia explains he's recovering from his injuries, and the princess tells her to thank him, along with the girl who can use spirit magic. Meanwhile, Linus is lying on his bed, feeling sore when Regina steps in. She asks how he's feeling, and mentions she prepared some apple pie for him. She mentions she will feed him some, but he rejects it. She then decides to reward him for his effort with a little peck. Linus gets embarrassed, and Regina tells him to keep it a secret from Celia. Under the princess's orders, the soldiers find the underground hideout of the demi-humans. The soldiers get in and tell them not to resist but an ominous voice warns them not to be so confident and casts a spell that turns them all to stone. Linus then appears, wearing a skull mask, and orders the demi-humans to get on their knees. He introduces himself as the true ruler of the world, Zal Vadis. He tells them to swear loyalty to him so he can grant them a place of refuge. The demi-humans give in, and Leo gives them a new name, the Devil Wolves. He then creates a labyrinth using magic and tells them to retreat there and prepare to resist the Empire. He then gets Celia's call and teleports away to avoid his identity being exposed. Celia tries to look for him in his room but finds Sherry instead. She blinks and suddenly Sherry is gone, leaving the room empty. Leo appears back into his room, happy he was able to recruit the remaining demi-humans. Regina brings in some food and they all have their breakfast. Celia tells Leo to eat healthy and he wonders if she's trying to make his blood more palatable for her. Suddenly, Regina tells everyone she thinks their dorm is haunted by phantom dogs and a ghost maid. Celia tells Regina she saw the ghost maid. Leo is convinced it's Sherry but he tells Celia it was her imagination. Celia asks him where he went, and he tells her he went for some solo training. Meanwhile, a guy picks up the demon sword left by Sharnak and offers it to the goddess. The sword disintegrates, making him wonder who brought Sharnak down. Celia's platoon is summoned for a mission. They are told that a city that vanished into the Void territory six years ago just appeared. This city, called the Third Assault Garden, is Celia and Regina's hometown. The city was heading towards them and it would reach their location in seven days. The officer tells them distress signals were sent from the city, and they wonder if there are survivors. Therefore, Celia's platoon is tasked with investigating the city. She tells them to check for survivors, investigate how the distress signal was sent and shut down the city if possible. They leave for the location the next day. Leo leaves Blackus behind to watch his kingdom and asks Sherry to accompany him. During the ride, Leo sleeps off and dreams of when Roselia told him in the past that she would disappear and be reincarnated a thousand years into the future. Leo promises to track her down no matter the form she takes. He wakes up just as they are arriving at the city. They split into different groups to investigate different parts of the city. 
Leo goes with Celia while the other three go together. Leo asks Sherry to follow the other three and look after them. Celia arrives at a place and recounts her experience. At that moment, a void alert goes off and they are attacked. Celia is pinned under a lamppost as a huge void emerges from the fog. Suddenly, a girl named Arl, one of the six heroes, appears in the middle of the city. She's surprised this is how the future looks in a thousand years. She doesn't know why she was sent to this particular period, but she knows the goddess would soon be born. She looks around the city and she's not familiar with its technology. Suddenly, the other guy walks up behind her and explains the technology. He introduces himself as Nefekes Void Lord. Arl asks him if he came from the past as well. He tells her he knows she's there to destroy the goddess vessel. Arl assumes he's the guardian of the vessel and tries to attack him. However, Nefekes disappears telling her she'll need to leave as he summons a huge void to keep her company. Meanwhile, the void attacking Celia is about to finish her off, but Leo teleports her underground to safety. He engages the void in a battle of spells, but the void can block low-level magic. Still, Leo decides to take it ducking seriously and uses level 9 magic to destroy the void. Leo rejoins Celia, telling her he was able to defeat the Void. Celia tries to get back on her feet, but Leo tells her not to push herself too much because even with her vampire abilities it will take time for her to heal. Suddenly people appear behind Celia and Leo thinks they are Voids. Celia notices the Duke's crest on their uniforms and one of them introduces himself as William Richmond. He's the head of the Order of House Crystalia which is under the command of Celia's father. He tells her though he's a ghost he hurried to her side to protect her. Leo notes that he hasn't experienced the phenomenon of ghost dwelling in battle sites in the present day until then. William tells Celia she must have received their distress signal for her to come to the city. She is surprised they were the ones who sent out the distress signal. But William tells her the signal wasn't a call for help but a warning. He tells her history may repeat itself if things are left unchecked because a new Void Lord appeared in the ruined city. He tells her the Void Lord is gathering power from the city's power plant and Celia tells Leo they need to hurry over there and find proof. Leo tells her she needs to rest, but William offers to give her a ride to the castle in a ghost limo. Leo tells her he doesn't trust ghosts to drive within the speed limit so he summons skeleton horses which pull the car. Meanwhile, the other three girls bump into Arl. Regina thinks she's a survivor and tries to check on her, but Sakuya pulls her back when she sees Arl's sword. Sakuya offers to take care of Arl, who mistakes the girls for Nefekes minions. They engage in a sword fight, but they are evenly matched. Sakuya almost gets a lethal strike with a swift move but she doesn't want to hurt Arl so she stops. She tells Arl she would have won if she was not wounded. Meanwhile, Celia is feeling better, but she asks Leo for some of his body juice. She jumps on him and starts drying him up when Elfine contacts her. Elfine asks her about the battle with the Void and Celia gives her the report. She also tells Elfine that a Void Lord might be hiding in the city and could be tampering with the power plant. Elfine tells her they are treating a survivor and they decide to regroup at the Crystalia estate. Celia asks for a little more body juice, but Leo presents her with a dress that increases her strength with her vampire mana. He tells her to use it wisely because it will drain her mana rapidly. Celia asks him why he suddenly gave her the dress and he reply that he doesn't want her to get hurt. He then gives her skeleton chains as good luck charms. Back to the girls, Regina finishes treating Arl. Elfine asks her why she attacked them as soon as they met, and she tells her she mistook them as allies of the Void Lord. Elfine looks through the Third Garden's database, but she can't find Arl's name. She asks her where she came from, but Arl asks them what they are doing in the city. Elfine answers the question, making Arl realize that humans still have a place in the world after so much time. Elfine then repeats her question, but Arl simply answers she must complete her task of defeating the goddess. Arl tries to continue on her own since they are not her enemies, but they stop her from moving alone. Her stomach growls and Sakuya gives her some snacks. Sherry is watching over the group, wondering what Arl is doing a thousand years in the future. Meanwhile, a void meets Nefekes and reports that one void was taken down. Nefekes wonders who took down his high-level void and decides it's fine for him to act. Leo and Celia arrive at her home, and Celia is flooded with memories of her past. They walk into the castle and Leo sits on a comfortable chair which reminds him of his throne. Celia goes upstairs and she is flooded with even more memories. She explores the castle grounds and she's eventually moved to tears. The ghosts reconstruct her father's room, and she recalls her father reading her a story about the demon lord and the hero. Suddenly, Nefekes' voice snaps her out of her memories. Nefekes tells her he didn't expect to see a young lady there. Celia asks him if he's a survivor, but he is annoyed she mistook him for a human. He starts casting fire magic and attacks her. Leo hears the noise upstairs and runs to check on Celia, who's knocked out. 
While knocked out, Celia dreams of a past event when her father asks her to get to the shelter with Regina. Celia tells him to come along with her, but he tells her he needs to go and fight to protect the people of the city. He tells her that's the duty that has been entrusted to their house. Celia asks him if she can join him in the fight, but he tells her they can fight together once she awakens her holy sword. Her father reminds her of the story of the evil demon lord. He tells her that he believes that one day, the evil demon lord will appear and help them defeat the voids. Celia wakes up to find three undead standing in front of her. Nefekes thinks that his level 3 magic can defeat a giant, but it's too much to deal with a human. The dust then clears out and he's shocked to see undead warriors. They tell Celia they will protect her. Nefekes apologizes for mistaking her as a mere human when she can invoke undead soldiers. He decides to test her defensive abilities, but Leo comes out of nowhere and casts a fireball at him, knocking him down. Celia asks him who the undead swordsmen are, and he tells her they were the keychains he gave her earlier. The undead warriors introduce themselves as the three heroes of Ragnas while striking some power ranger poses. They tell Leo to rest easy because they will protect Celia. Nefekes gets back to his feet, telling Leo he would have been done for if he was a mere human. Leo recognizes him and wonders what he is doing in the future. He launches a fire attack at Leo but he counters it with ice that restrains Nefekes. Nefekes asks him to identify himself, but Leo tells him to answer his question first. Leo asks him what he's after, but the ground suddenly rumbles. Nefekes laughs and tells Leo the vessel has played her role, and the goddess has come back to life. He tells Leo his services are no longer needed because the world will crumble to the might of the goddess. Leo tries to stop him, but he vanishes away. Leo wonders what Nefekes is doing in the present and if he awoke Rosiria. The symbol of the sacred order is cast into the sky and the undead warriors tell them they need to evacuate the building. A huge creature appears and William tells Celia to get to safety. Several void creatures move around as the hymn of the sacred order plays. Leo recognizes the hymn and he identifies the creature as the remnant of Saint Terrace, one of the six heroes. Celia reports to the other three and they immediately swing into action, leaving Arl behind with some food. They launch a missile which releases a backup signal. The void creatures swarm around the city as the other three decide to meet with Celia. Celia and the undead warriors keep fighting the voids but any damage they regenerate any injury inflicted on them. Regina and Sakuya are having the same trouble with the voids who attack them. Elfine does a scan, and she tells them the head is the creature's weak spot. Leo tells Celia the same thing and they can now easily defeat the voids. Saint Terrace moves towards Leo and Celia. Leo is happy she's saving them the trouble of going to her to bring her down. Celia, Leo and the undead warriors keep attacking the endless wave of voids. Leo decides to bring an end to the wave of voids and casts a huge magic spell on Saint Terrace. She is melted by the spell, but she regenerates. Leo is surprised she withstood such a level 10 spell. She casts a level 11 spell of her own and Leo puts up a defensive barrier. She releases several magma stones which destroy everything around her. Leo tells Celia he's going to finish off Saint Terrace and asks her to watch his back. The undead warriors and Celia protect him from the voids as he jumps and draws out his demon sword. He tries to strike at Saint Terrace but the sword starts resonating. Suddenly, Rosalia's voice comes out of Saint Terrace, asking if he wants to use the sword to kill her. Leo doesn't understand what's going on as the voice tells him he can't use his sword to bring her down. Leo strikes at Terrace but the strike is blocked and she casts a spell that shoots light arrows in every direction. Leo is hit by a light arrow, and he's knocked to the ground. Terrace prepares to cast another spell, but Celia summons the dress Leo gave her, leveling up to waifu material, and uses blood magic to immobilize Terrace. The undead warriors protect Leo from the void and Celia picks him up. Leo remembers promising to find Roselia if she ever resurrects. He wakes up in Celia's arms and tells her to run for her life. She hugs him and tells her to drink his body juice so she can run. Instead, she pours her mana into him. Leo remembers Roselia asking him to make a promise. She wants him to kill her if she comes back as something else in the future. Leonis refuses, but she urges him to remember and find her real body through the guidance of his demon sword. He's now convinced it was not a dream, but a memory Roselia sealed away until the right time. Celia is still trying to use her blood to inject mana into Leo's body, but he keeps remembering the moment when Roselia asks him to kill her with the demon sword if she turns into something different in the future. She tells him that by doing it, he will be able to find her real self, and the demon sword will lead him to his destiny. Leo finally wakes up and realizes that Roselia had put a seal on his memory to forget his promise to her. However, he refuses to give up and gets up to see Terrace regenerating. He then promises that he will do anything to find the real Roselia. 
He picks up the demon sword again and Celia asks about his wounds. He explains that he's now fine because she saved him when she her mana to heal him. He's still confused because he doesn't understand if his memories returned at the right time, or if it's because Celia returned all the blood that she drained him. He then turns to Celia and she can rip part of her dress and give it to him. She complies and he uses it to fully heal his wounds. Terris then starts getting up, and the two prepare to fight. However, they're stopped by William, who also wants to lend his strength. He asks if Leo has a way to use his magic to put their souls to rest. They feel like they fulfilled their job as knights of Celia's family. Celia asks if he can do it and Leo confirms he can. One of the knights explains that some knights' souls were turned into voids when Terris appeared 42 days ago. Linus looks around and sees several soul orbs. He realizes that Terris turned into a void lord on the same day that his seal was broken. She then used the souls of the knights by turning them into voids to attack the assault garden. William asks for their wish to be fulfilled, and Linus promises to give them a place for their souls to rest. He uses the demon sword to cast a spell that absorbs all the souls into an orb. The knights thank him for fulfilling their last request, but Leo explains that he wants to ask for a favor. He wants the knights to help them. He then summons several skeleton knights from the ground, and then merges the knight's ghost form with these new bodies. William realizes that he can now fulfill his job as a knight. Leo then turns to Celia and explains that he still hasn't recovered enough power to defeat Terris. That's why she and the knights must find a way to buy him some time, especially since Terris will summon several other voids. Celia tells him to leave it to her and raises her holy sword. She then uses her own blood to create several spears for the knights. Every skull knight starts getting hyped out to fight. Meanwhile, Elfine finishes making the preparations with her team to fight the Void Lord. They prepare to leave on their bikes, but Arl stops them. She asks them to take her as she wants to join the fight. Regina mentions that would be stupid because she's still injured. Suddenly, a Void comes toward Arl, but she deletes it with a simple swing. The girls are impressed, and she explains that she's the only strong enough to defeat the Void Lord. She then claims that her holy sword was born to destroy those monsters. Sakuya then comes forward, stating that it would be easier to defeat the Void Lord with her power. She tells Elfine to allow her to join them, and if something goes wrong, Sakuya will find a way to protect the girls. Elfine accepts and they prepare to head out. Back to Celia, she's fighting the voids alongside the soldiers. Every single one is capable of dealing with the monsters. They're trying to give Leo as much time as he needs to recover his power by absorbing the remaining lost souls. However, he feels like it is taking so much time. Meanwhile, the girls are driving to meet Leo and Celia but they notice the quantity of voids around. Elfine says she will use her power to drive Regina's bike, allowing Arhatis to attack the flying voids. Regina accepts the orders and summons her cannon to shoot the beasts. One of the voids focuses on Elfine, but Sakuya slices it in half. Celia then tells the knights to move forward while keeping formation. However, she doesn't notice a void attacking her from behind. One of the skeletons defeats the void, while another manages to catch her. She notices she isn't injured, and they explain that it's because she has the Vampire Queen's power. She thinks that's mostly due to her dress, as Leo explained that it would help her control her power. She flies back up to continue the fight, mentioning that she must do everything to protect Leo. The skeletons for some reason also start flying and defeating several voids in midair. That's when you realize that a single skeleton is more powerful than the average student. Celia then notices something on her back. Leo is absorbing a huge quantity of souls and the ball has become huge. The Void Lord looks at him and starts casting several magic circles. He knows this is bad because he still needs more time to use his full power. Terra's magic circle then changes direction toward them. Leo yells at everyone to run away and take cover. Terrace then activates the magic, launching several magma balls toward them. However, everyone grouped up in pairs, one using magic to create a shield, while the other flies them away. Celia asks if Leo is okay, but he explains that he's fine, he just needs a bit more power. Meanwhile, Elfine and the girls watch everything from afar and she tries to contact Celia. Regina wonders if everything is okay, but Elfine isn't sure. Suddenly, a huge void appears behind them. Regina tries to shoot it down, but it deals no damage. The void activates some power, creating four laser beams. But suddenly, a whip catches its arm and thrusts it into a building, destroying it. Turns it at Sherry, who simply puts it as she completed her task as the Demon Lord's maid. Back to the battle, the skeletons are doing their best to defeat as many voids as possible while Leo is finishing absorbing enough power. He creates a huge ball, however, Terrace creates another spell with several magic circles. Leo then slowly starts transferring the souls into his demon sword. 
but for some reason, Terrace forgets about her magic circles and decides to pick up a building instead. Since Leo cannot move, Celia combines her vampire queen powers with her holy sword to slice it in half. Leo then remembers Roselia's words and realizes the truth. She asked him to kill the future fake version of her and find the real goddess. He finishes charging the sword with the power of the souls and activates his power. However, Terrace activates a divine shield. Leo is surprised by this, but he has no other option. Meanwhile, the girls are finally getting near Terrace and Arl gets up, charging up her attack. Sakuya tells Elfine to get them closer and everyone prepares to attack at the same time. Sakuya and Regina use their holy swords to open a breach in the barrier, giving Arl a chance to cast her attack. The attack hits Terrace, who deactivates the barrier. Leonis is confused about who is able to do it, but he doesn't have time to wait. He uses all the power that he has been storing and casts it on Terrace. The Void's body slowly starts disappearing and Celia cannot believe her eyes. She remembers her father's words, mentioning that he believed that one day, the Demon Lord would appear to protect humanity from the Voids. The Voids start disappearing, followed by Terrace. The Assault City then stops moving, signaling their victory. In the aftermath, the night souls leave the skeletons' bodies. William tells her that he is proud to fight alongside Celia in their final moments. Celia then mentions he would be prouder if he fought alongside her parents and sister. However, before disappearing, William mentions that she's the last survivor of the family and should make them all proud. The girls arrive, and Celia runs towards Regina's arms. The group is happy to see everyone is safe, and Sakuya explains that Arl helped them destroy the Divine Barrier. Some choppers arrive, and Fenris is happy that Celia and the rest are safe. They quickly step inside and Leonis is now sure that Arl is the one who destroyed it. However, he doesn't understand how a hero from 1000 years ago is still alive. Celia asks why he looks so worried, but he replies that he's fine. He notices a book in her hands. She explains she found it in her father's study, so she decided to bring it as a memento. However, she cannot understand the language. She mentions that her father could read it, and the book talks about the Demon Lord. Leo is surprised, and she explains the legend of the Demon Lord, mentioning that he was once a hero. Leo's reaction almost gives him off, and she asks why he's active like that. However, he manages to brush it off. After returning, Leo tells Blackas about Nefikes and to investigate. He explains that he caused this whole situation with Terrace, and that he must know something about Roselia. Sherry also reveals her concerns about Arl and tells Leo to be careful. However, she also mentions that Leo gave Celia a dress. He asks if there's a problem, but she looks at her maid outfit and calls him an idiot. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.